Hey, this last uh, month has been a little bit, this is no surprise to most of you, has been a, um, a little bit of a tumultuous month for us. We uh, finished a year-long journey of um, walking with my mother-in-law, Lorraine, through uh, the last days of her life and um, moved in with us a year ago Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, and we had the privilege of, of sharing this past year with her. And, and uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, yesterday was the celebration of life. And, uh, you know, we've, so we've had, some, we've had some stuff to deal with, just like you have. We're not alone in that. There's a lot of people have gone through that, a lot of people that continue to go through that. And, you know, it's just, for me, I, um, I'm one of those people that when it gets to the first of the year, here at Crossroads, we typically use this time to kind of refocus on our, on our core values and our mission statement, and we just do that as kind of a refresher for you each year. Uh, we're going to do that in a different way this year, and I'm really super excited. Next week, uh, when you come in, the trees will be gone, and I'm not even going to tell you what's going to be up here, but you're going to be overwhelmed. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool, and we're going to start a brand new series we're calling uh, Charting a New Course. I think that's what we titled, charting a new course, and it's all about adjustments and and uh, assessing where we are and making adjustments to to get where we need to be. And um, I'm I am not a resolution New Year's resolution person. Now, if you are, that's great for you. But here we are, like what is it, January eighth? So most of those are not even good anymore. Right? So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just being honest how many of you okay well no don't raise your hands I was gonna say how many of you have made a resolution but here eight days later it's like ah man but um but I'm not that but I do always like to take this part of the year and sort of reevaluate where I'm at and this I think it's more poignant right now because of what we've been through uh in recent days it's made this even more emphatic in my life is to say, you know, where am I? Where am I going? And what, what does God have for me? <clears throat> well, it's, it's really, um, for me, one of those wake-up call passages is the Apostle Paul talking to his, what he calls, son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy was the, his protege, the guy that stepped up, was going to be the, the next man up. Uh, he was going to be the guy to take over when Paul is done. We're, we're at that point in Paul's life uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 where uh, you see that um, he's, he's reaching that point where things are turning a corner and, uh, and he's giving some last minute instruction to Timothy, his, his uh, mentoree. And um, those of you in the room that have coached at all or if you've been on a team with a coach, you know, the times they'll, be, they'll call a timeout, critical point of the game. Uh, sometimes the coaches will let the team members just talk. And then at the very last second before the timeout's over, the coach will say, okay, listen, this is what I want you to focus on. And this is kind of what Paul's doing in this passage is he's kind of, he's, he's more or less saying to Timothy, okay, I want you to focus here. I want you to focus. And I want to share a message today called a life well lived. A life well lived. And I think, you know, there's a lot of things we could say. If, if I ask you today, say, hey, you know, <clears throat> what would you consider uh, hallmarks of a life well lived? I'm not going to do that. We're not going to take time. Sometimes we do, but I just want you to think in your own mind today, what would those things be? Like if you're thinking a uh, life well lived would be X, Y, Z. You know, some people would say uh, watching my kids grow up, watching my kids have kids, watching my grandkids grow up, uh, my, being the best person on the job that I could be, uh, having an employer or, or fellow employees that say, hey, this guy was, this person was a good person uh, and, or she ran this company well or whatever the, whatever the thing would be, the hallmark to say, hey, this was a life well lived, a life well lived. And I think you know, a lot of times we focus more maybe on those external things that aren't really that important. But I want to have you just for a few moments today, let's just focus on what does it mean to have a life well lived? I think Paul's giving Timothy a working definition of that. I think he's telling him, hey, this is how you live life well. This is how you finish well. This is how you do life and when it's all over 
no regrets. I was, we had the opportunity this week of um, uh, sharing with the Oyama students. We call them, it's an Oregon Youth Alive Ministry Academy. I think I said that right. Um, and they brought about six or eight of their students that are ministry students. They came and, and uh, we had a couple hours to sit with Pastor Travis, myself, and Pastor Alex. And we just got to pour into their lives. They asked questions and, and we poured into their life. And, you know, I want to finish well. When this is over, when I'm done, whenever that is, I, I, I thought it was Friday, but no, I just, I, <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad, but it was, it was bad. But anyways, uh, you know, whenever it's done, I want to be able to, uh, and, and one of the students, we asked him, said, how, you know, I forget what the question was, Pastor Trav asked him a question, and his answer was, he said, if I was to, the kid's like 22, you know, he said, if I was to die tomorrow, I want to have no regrets, no regrets. And I'm thinking, that's me. That's my goal. I, wanna, I don't want to leave anything undone. Or I don't want to leave. And you know, when we look at Paul here in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he's giving this, this rally call to Timothy. And he's saying to him, he says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. My, the time of my departure is near. And I want you to look at this list. I fought a good fight, finished the race, I've kept the faith. And I love this part. He says, <clears throat> now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge himself will award me on that day. Not only to me, but to all those, all those who've longed for his reappearing. When you look at that for just a second, I want to focus on a couple of things because, like I said, I believe Paul's giving Timothy a working definition of a life well lived. What does that mean? Well, Real quickly today, I want, to, I want to show you a couple of things, three things in particular. I want to show you that Paul takes a look around, he takes a look back, and he takes a look ahead. And he, and he defines what it means to have a, wife, a life well lived. First of all, he takes, he takes a look around. He takes a look around. Look at what he said. He, he assessed the situation. He's, he's looking at where they are. He's looking at what's going on. He's looking at <clears throat> all that's happening. And I apologize. I know that's irritating to hear somebody <clears throat> clear their throat all the time, but I'm, I'm sorry. I can't do anything about it. Um, but you know, he, he said, I'm going to, I've assessed the situation and here's the deal. Here's the deal. My time is up, but, but I want you to look at that. He says, I'm being poured out. My life is being poured out like a drink offering to the Lord. You know, when I look at that, a couple of things strike me. One of them is this, that he's saying, I'm the one doing the pouring out. You know what immediately came to my mind when I read that, again, for the 18 millionth time? Is, that's just like Jesus in his last days, wasn't it? You remember he's standing before Pilate and Herod eventually, but, but he's talking to Pilate, and Pilate says, you know, just talk to me, man. I have the ability to set you free. I have the ability to do, you know, to save your life. And remember, and it's classic, Jim Caviezel does such a great job in that beat up bloody face of his when he turns to him and says, you don't have any power over me. You don't have anything but what I give you. I want you to recognize something because I think we look at that sometimes from a place of defeatism, of, of being pushed down or being left out or whatever. Jesus said to Pilate, you can, you can try. The reality, think about it, man. This is the son of God. He could have called down legions of angels at that moment and made a mess of that place. But he said, you don't have any power over me but what I give you. But I lay down my life. I lay down my life to accomplish my mission, and that is to see souls saved. Think about it. Paul's saying the same thing here. Paul's saying the same thing here. He's saying, I'm not going to, you're not taking, Rome was breathing down his neck, literally. I mean, in just a few hours from writing this, he was going to have his head chopped off for the faith. But Paul is saying, you're not taking my life. I'm giving my life. I'm giving my life for the mission. I want to just ask you this morning. I hope this is reflective for you as you go through this this morning. Because I think there's a lot of questions we need to ask ourselves. Number one is, am I living my life in a way 
where I'm pouring myself out like a drink offering to accomplish the mission? Or am I blaming everybody under the sun? Well, you know, if this hadn't happened, I'd have been a better... You know, if this wouldn't have happened, I'd have, Well, if this wouldn't happen, if so-and-so would have... You know, I don't know, that great theological seminary group, the Eagles, remember them from... <laughs> they had a reunion tour a while back and and one of the songs the new songs they presented was get over it and he said uh, uh, they said Glenn Fry said you know this comes from watching too much daytime TV but bottom line he said get over it and we do that we blame everybody under the sun don't we how about we take responsibility for where we are? Can I just tell you something that's absolute truth? We can't choose what happens to us, but we can choose how we respond to every situation that happens to us. And I choose to pour my life out. Can I just tell you that I think it puts us in a place of invulnerability because if we lay down our life for God, what can mere man do to us? Think about it. I don't know if it's true or not or really happened or not, but it's a great story. The story is told of Martin Luther when he's going through the Reformation and the, the Satan himself literally appeared to him in a physical form and said, Martin Luther, if, you, if, you, if you'll stop doing all this stuff and, and you know, rousing up the kingdom of God, I will give you everything you ever wanted. Martin Luther supposedly said to him, too late. I've already given it. I already have everything that I could possibly need. God has given that to me. Satan in a fury said, if you don't stop, I'm going to take everything you have. And he said, too late again, because I've already given it all back to God. Can I just say today that to put yourself in a place, listen, I'm, you're going to get hurt. You're going to get beat up. Life is tough. We're not, we don't live in, in this peaches and cream world where everything is sweet and wonderful. There are nasty things that happen out there. We live in a, I grew, I'm, I'm in an America today that I never grew up with. In a culture today that I never thought would happen. But you know what? What can mere man do to me if my life is committed fully? If God be for me, who can be against me? That's what the scripture said. Look at this. He said, my time for departure is near. I'm being poured out. I'm giving myself up as a drink offering to God because my departure is near. I like that word. In the English language, we translate it departure, but in the Greek, it has several meanings. And I want to give you a couple of them because I think it's interesting to kind of framework what Paul was thinking at the time. One of the meanings of that word in the Greek is to hoist anchor and set sail. To hoist anchor and set sail. Paul is literally saying, I'm going to pour out my life like a drink offering, and I'm about ready to hoist anchor and get out of here. Hallelujah. You know, I was raised on Southern gospel music, and Bill Gaither was my Sunday school teacher. Not really, but kind of. And, you know, all kinds of songs come through my head when I think about this particular thing. But there's an old chorus we used to sing all the time. And I don't, not really in singing form today, but it goes something like this. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's shores. Listen, I want to remind you something. When this is all over here, we have a home in heaven. We have a home in heaven. And we can afford to lay down our life. We can afford to put it all on the line. Why? Because God is going to give us so much more than we could ever give ourselves or ever produce for ourselves or ever accomplish by ourselves. God has a wonderful plan for our life that's going to prosper us, not harm us, give us a hope and a future. Hallelujah. There's some churches right now, they get excited about something like that. Another Another definition for that word departure in the Greek is to fold up the tent. I think that's an awesome, I think that's an awesome uh, illustration. Paul talks about folding up the tent in another portion of Scripture that he authored. He, 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he talks about, he says this, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Think of that. We, we worry so much about the rips and tears on this earthly tent. Hey, let me tell you something. It's all going to burn. The Bible says this. There's only two things that are going to survive. The word of God and those that trust it. And I want to tell you something today that we can, we can take the beating. We can take the buffering. We can take all those things because we know that someday Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to go. I'm going away and I'm going to come back, and I'm going, to, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you can be in my Father's house, many mansions. John 14. We were laughing, you know, Terry is, God bless her. Terry is like, if there ever was such a thing, she's 100% phlegmatic personality type. You're not supposed to be 100% anything, but she is. <clears throat> She's ever the peacemaker, right? And those of you who know her that, like, you never, you ask her, hey, what do you think? Well, I, she's always wondering, what does he want me to say? Because that's what I'm going to try to say here. <laughs> we have a great marriage. It's strong. It's amazing. One of the only frustrations I've had in the 40-some years of marriage is just tell me the truth. <laughs> tell me what you're really feeling right now. And you know, Terry... So we were in the office the other day, and I, and I call on the boys, Travis and Alex. We were all talking. We are talking football, so it gets a little animated sometimes in the office. And Terry, you know, she gets, she gets confused. You know, she doesn't realize that when you're talking football and you raise your voices, you're not mad. You're not really trying to kill each other. You're just, you're just getting excited, right? And she got a little nervous. She goes, guys, guys, what eternal value is it? We coined, we, coined, we coined that phrase in the early days of child raising. And Pastor Alex, I got to give him props, man. Dude, the guy came through in a clutch. I mean, he was sharp as a tack. He goes, wait, hold on a second. Was it Newsboys? Is that who sang that song? Uh, okay. Audio Adrenaline? Is that what? Yeah. They, they, he said, remember that song of theirs? It's a big, big house with lots and lots of room. Big, big yard. So we can play football. <laughs> <laughs> score one for Alex but the reality of the matter is we don't have to worry about this stuff we gotta live life poured out used up I want to be like that young student of ministry. I want to, if, if tomorrow is my last day, I don't want to leave anything undone. I want I no regrets. I want to pour out my life for God. And I want to, when it comes time to fold up the tent, so to speak, I want to move into that permanent home that he has. About a month ago, Lorraine started packing up the tent. And you know, we could send her off with joy in our hearts amidst the sorrow. Because we know that that old tent was getting some tears and rips. But she's going to a place where God had already built something that's going to last. And we can, the Bible says we sorrow not as those who have no hope. It doesn't say we don't sorrow. But we have a hope and a trust that there's an eternal building not built by human hands that God has prepared for those who love him. Well, he was looking around, but he also decided he's going to take a look back. He assessed the current situation, understood what he needed to do, but to bolster his faith, he took a look back, if you will, and he looked over his life, and he says this, I fought a good fight, I finished the race. Fought a good fight, finished the race. You know, when I was thinking about that, I thought about, Paul talks about, uh, in Corinthians also, he talks about like a boxer, you know, we don't fight like we're beating the air. He said we train and we discipline. So we, we bring our bodies under and we, we do all this stuff to train. And he talks about being able to compete lest, you know, he himself become a, a castaway. And, I, and he understood this concept 
of, of putting it all on the line and giving it your best effort. But I love what he says here. I fought the good fight. He didn't say, I've been in a lot of fights. You know, when we were meeting with those students this week, they said, tell us the, the good, the bad, and the bad, and the ugly. Tell us, tell us, you know, try to talk us out of going into ministry. And I'm like, well, I can't do that. I've been beat up a little bit. You know, one of the first lessons I learned when God called me to be a shepherd of, of sheep, sheep bite. I thought we were just supposed to get along, you know. I was totally confused. I thought the body of Christ was supposed to be built. You know, when Jesus said, they'll know we we're Christians by our love. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. But you know what? It's not, he didn't say, I've been in a lot of fights. He said, I fought the good fight. What he's saying there, I believe, is I didn't sacrifice my integrity along the way. You know, I'm, I'm reminded, you remember when, uh, remember uh, the different times in your life when you struggled and maybe there was that moment where you could, life would have been easier to do something that was a little less than maybe totally above board. Remember Joseph? Remember Joseph in the Bible when he got sold into slavery by his brothers? And remember, he's, he's in that house working and Potiphar's wife wants to compromise his integrity and basically she grabs out and grabs a hold of his coat and he runs out of his coat to flee that situation. I believe what he was saying when he left that day was you can have my coat, but you can't have my character. Amen. There are things in your life that are going to cause you to have to say, listen, you can have all this stuff, but you can't have my character. Because I want to, when it's all said and done, I want to be able to say, I fought the good fight. Have I made mistakes? Absolutely. Have I made wrong decisions? No kidding. But you know what? I want to be able to stand one day and say, listen, I fought the good fight. I held my testimony and I, st and I strove to be that person that God had called me to be. In, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he said, Paul, uh, or the writer of scripture here is saying, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. The task of what is it? Testifying to the good news of God's grace. Even in her hard times, in those last few weeks, Lorraine continued to point the the point her back to Jesus wasn't about her it was about him that's what I want to stand I want to finish strong I want, to, I want it to be about him in my life not me him I want to finish the race strong Philippians chapter 3 Paul says brothers and sisters I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it but one thing I do forgetting what is behind straining toward what is ahead I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And he says this, Paul says, I kept the faith. I kept the faith. Switches gears here from an athletic comparison to a steward or someone who's been entrusted with something. He said, I've kept the faith. And I want to tell you today, when I look at that, I think of that story, the parable that Jesus gave, uh, we call it the parable of talents, and, and we think of that as, you know, remember the story, the master is going away on a journey, and he gives, he gives to one, uh, one of his workers five talents, to another three, another one, and, and talents is just a, is a uh, uh, financial measurement, it's not, although, I mean, we get confused sometimes, we hear talents, we think abilities, and it applies, but basically what he's saying, think of it as bags of gold instead, because that's really what the illustration is trying to establish. And you remember the story. He goes away for a long time, and when he comes back, he said, okay, boys, it's time to account what, what happened. What'd you do? And remember, they call him in, and, and the guy with five bags of gold says, hey, I, I invested what you gave me, and I, and I produced five more, and, and uh, it's here you go. 
And the, and the next guy up said the same thing. He goes, I took all the ones you gave me. I invested them. I doubled it. Here you go. And you remember the last one says, you know, you're a hard taskmaster. Taskmaster. That's hard to say without a cough drop in your mouth. <laughs> he said, I was afraid you'd demand too much of me. He said, you, you expect to reap harvest from fields you don't even plant. So I was afraid. So I just buried my talents. So I could bring it so I wouldn't lose anything and give it back to you. Man, he got a tongue lashing from the master. What a disappointment. But to those who invested what, it would get, what was given them, the master said this, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling these small amounts, so now I'm going to give you many more responsibilities. Now let's go se celebrate. Let me tell you something, friends. Uh, this is not a guilt trip. This is not supposed to make you feel bad or anything, but can I just simply ask the question, what are you doing with what God gave you? Are you investing that in other means and ways? Are you, are you pouring that into things that will produce a heavenly harvest? Or are you just holding on to it for fear? If you give any of it away, you'll lose it. Listen, I've, I've been there, done that. I will tell you, you can't outgive God. That just when you think, oh man, I'm a, if I give this away, I don't know. Guess what? God's always got more in the bank. And he wants us to live that kind of life of abandonment. I, we, use, we need to be good stewards. We need to good, do, use good plans and be wise in how we conduct ourselves. But let's be people sold out, poured out like a drink offering. Because you know what? I've looked around and the time is short. We don't know how much time we have. It may be a long time, maybe a short time. But we need to use what we have and invest it wisely so that when he calls us into account, we can produce a harvest for him. Say, Lord, this is what you gave me, and I've worked hard to preserve that, but also see a reward. I want to tell you lastly, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come and get ready to wrap us up with some worship here today. Lastly, Paul takes a look ahead. Takes a look around, makes sure that he understands the situation, and that's good for us to do. We should all do that from time to time. Take inventory. You know, if I've learned nothing else on Friday nights, one of the best lessons I learned is that we need to regularly take inventory of our life. Yes. And you know, when we take inventory, remember, some of you know what I'm talking about. You don't just write down the failures. You write down the successes as well. Because God is always at work doing stuff in our lives. And we can't just write down the shortcomings. We need to also write down the accomplishment. And listen, there are times in our lives and we need to sit down and just say, you know what? Here's where I'm at. Is this where I want to be? Is this where God wants me to be? Am I headed in the right direction? But I want you to do it with that reckless abandon that's afforded us by knowing that this is not the end. He looked ahead. He said, now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord himself will produce for me. You know what I love about a relationship with God is it's so personal. Yes. It's so personal. If you, haven't, if you haven't committed your life to Christ, I would encourage you to do so. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, I don't even know what that means. I'm talking about just saying, God, you know what? My life is out of control. I've, I've tried my best, but I can't do it. I need you to take over. And I give up. I just surrender my life to you. Please take my life and make me what you want it to be. 1 John 1, 9, we say it all the time around here. If we confess our sins or our shortcomings, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, all we have to do is acknowledge the wrongdoing and confess our need of him. And he's more than ready and willing to change our lives and to make us complete and restore us. One of the wonderful things I love about having that relationship with God is it's personal. Paul said, one day I'm going to get a crown, and it's not going to be passed down from some angelic being. The Lord himself is going to give me that crown. Paul talks about, he talks about one day the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and he'll come and get us and take us home. Dead in Christ shall rise first, and we were alive, will be caught up to meet him in the air comfort each other with these words. 
I love that personal relationship. I pray that every day for my grandsons and for friends of mine, God, let them come to that personal relationship. Not their mom and dad's faith, not their, not their grandparents' faith, but their own decision to follow you. Because that personal relationship is one that in the difficult times, he's there to hold you up. In the difficult times, you can look to him and cry out to him and know that he's there and he'll respond to you. But let me just remind you of something that you may have forgotten. When this is all over, we're going to wear a crown on the other side. You know, can I just be honest with you? There's, there's passages of scripture that bother me. One of those, one of those passages for me is when Paul says our light and momentary affliction will produce a weight of a weightier glory for us. I don't know about you, but none of the afflictions I'm going through feel light or momentary. They feel huge and forever. He also says this, that in Jesus said, in this world you're going to have struggles and trials, but don't worry about it, I've overcome the world. Here's another one I want to give you before we go to prayer today, and that's this. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, it hasn't even entered the heart of Walt Disney. <laughs> what God has prepared for those who love him. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I know we're Disney people, so when we go there, we lose our minds. We become kids all over again. Nothing's impossible in Disneyland, right? And I've seen some beautiful things. The birth of my children, my wife walking down the aisle on our wedding day. God's grace demonstrated in our lives over the years. But the Bible says I haven't even come close to what God has ready for me. I just want to remind you today it's worth the fight. It's worth the struggle. Fight the fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith so that we can stand before him one day with joy in our hearts that we gave it all for him. Let's bow our heads today. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your love and goodness to us. We're so thankful, Lord, that you care about us and you love us so much. Lord, we're thankful for the heart of the Father. Lord, in your illustration of that, you said while the prodigal son was still afar off, the Father ran and met him and embraced him. Lord, wherever we are in our journey, Lord, you are ready and willing to meet us and, and hug us and hold us and provide for us and restore us. So, Lord, today we come and, Lord, we want to inventory our lives. We want to look deep in our hearts. And, Lord, if there's anything at all that would stand between us and you, anything that would halt a personal, close relationship with you, Lord, today we ask you to remove it. We ask you to forgive us. We ask you to restore us. And we ask you, Lord, to fill us with your Holy Spirit and your power in such a way, Lord, that we can finish strong. Lord, that we can be willing and able to, to lay it all down as a drink offering to you today. Lord, that we can look around and see where we are and say, God, here's what we want to do. Lord, we can do this because when we look back, we see you've been there all along. We can look ahead and know that you have great things in store for us. So, Lord, do in us what we can't do for ourselves. Lift us up. Fill us. Use us, oh God, to encourage others in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Stand together with me if you're able, would you please? I want to pray a blessing over you before you go. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And you're laying down and you're rising up and you're going out and you're coming in and your labor and your leisure, your laughter and your tears till one day we stand around that throne room and worship him as one family of believers. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Go in God.